So, hello everybody. <coughs> My name is Oskar Burri, and I'm going to talk to you about good enough cloud architecture. Um, let's start with the same joke, who am I? Um, I'm a cloud architect at uh, Solida Germany, and I'm an engineer by heart. I always knew when I was a kid I want to become an engineer. I just didn't know what kind of an engineer, because apparently you have to choose nowadays. So uh, I studied some automation engineering, but I ended up at Solita as a software designer around five years ago. However, <coughs> I noticed um, quite quickly that my real passion was uh, cloud technologies, and I started going towards that direction pretty fast. Um, three years ago, I moved to Munich to see a bit different side of the world and to kind of found a new Solita office partly there. And there I did a bigger career change and started focusing more and more towards cloud technologies, in my case, Microsoft Asia. Um, in my free time, I'm a good Bavarian. I drink beer with my friends. I go skiing. I also started hiking to, uh, during the pandemic because that was basically the only thing that was allowed. Good. Um, Today's agenda, um, we will start with some motivations, some disclaimers, then we go to the good stuff, hopefully. And finally, we have some takeaways, things that I would like you to remember also tomorrow when you wake up. And finally, we will have a break so you can go refresh yourselves. Um, this is going to be kind of a high-level talk where we do a couple of deep dives into a real-world experiences that hopefully make the things a bit concrete if they seem a bit abstract. Um, I try to help you to understand some of the major sources of complexity that usually surprises you in projects using cloud platforms. Good. Um, like said, this presentation has a quite strong Asia flavor and therefore it might be a bit enterprisey. Sorry about that, that's my job. Good. Um, as a motivation, um, why should you care? Well, in my opinion, building IT systems is always a compromise uh, between over and under engineering stuff. You want to make it good enough so it fulfills the requirements, but you don't want to spend too much effort on it if it doesn't bring you anything. We will be focusing a bit more on the over engineering part because under engineering is not that interesting. It's just a badly made system. Mm, like I said, that everything is a compromise. Uh, usually the things that you compromise between is current money, some future money, uh, security and performance. And again, like I said, if you are over engineering one part of your system, it always means that that money is away from some other things that c could bring uh, more value somewhere else, or actually make your security much better somewhere else. So optimizing how well you do things makes things better. Um, most of the decisions we do to affect the, these things, if it's over or under, uh, under engineered, are done in everyday work. However, I think that the most impactful ones are done uh, when you're defining the frames where you are working. And usually that's then architectural work. Of course, as time passes along, things change, you need to readjust. But making good frames for the everyday work makes your work easier and productive. Good security measures that are according to what you need might mean that when the developer makes a mistake, the database is not made public, for example. That has happened lately in Finland. So, the most common sources for mistakes that will leave you with an over or under engineered solution. This is a kind of a boring one, traditional one. Everybody, everybody has heard about this one. But I want to remind you that even though I'm, I'm a re really a cloud enthusiast, I, well, my title has cloud in it and I only do cloud projects, but I still want to remind everybody that you shouldn't get too carried away with neat things you can do with cloud. Uh, doing things properly in an on-prem system is better than doing cloud stuff badly, incompetently. However, if you do things incompetently, I think it's better to do them in cloud than on-prem. <laughs> Personal opinion. 
Um, also lately there has been this trend and I've seen a lot of blog posts that talk about how we moved from the cloud to on-prem and we saved a lot of money. And I think that's a really interesting topic because I actually agree with some of those posts. If you have a highly specific workload, for example, you have a, a really high egress system and you cannot utilize products like uh, content delivery networks, it might make sense to have some on-prem components in your system, even if you're building it completely from a green field. Uh, another example could be if you have really high-scale static workloads. For example, in research, you often have that, that you have a big cluster and it's running 24-7 on full utilization. There it might be that it's much more sensible to have it in on-prem. Takeaway, don't set yourself to fail by forcing cloud environments if they don't make sense. Good. Then to kind of the more interesting topics, I guess. Um, identity and access management. I always recommend that you should embrace centralized IAM. It has bought so much advantages uh, that just make your everyday work usually easier but also much, much more secure. You can easily implement MFA, you can implement conditional access, have fine-grained access controls, and the most important part, you gain some visibility. You understand better what your employees are doing, who is using it from where. So when something weird happens, you know that it's weird. Um, in Azure context, this would be, then be Azure AD and the services revolving around it, like privileged identity management and stuff like that. Embrace IAM. Um, with IAM, usually you want to implement some modes or some versions of least privileged, meaning um, you should give users and systems uh, the minimum amount of access required so they can perform, do their job, fulfill their function. Uh, however, this is really hard if you don't have uh, really clear roles for the systems and users, and especially if you have these superhero users that are always called when there is an issue and, and there are some problems, they go all over around and debug issues. Because superheroes need superhero privileges. You cannot fix a complex uh, complex issue that is spanning over multiple systems if you don't have visibility over those systems. A second reason for having issues in, in, in least privileged implementation is that if your environments are badly segregated, so you have put too much different things in a single bucket, and afterwards the technical measures cannot give you kind of a separation who actually is working where and doing what. And finally, if scopes are creeping, so basically meaning um, the projects are always taking on new responsibilities and people are taking on new responsibilities. So don't over-engineer uh, least privileged if you don't have the required prerequisites in your organization. On the other hand, if your organization is ready for it, and especially if you have a process where modifying access rights uh, and when you, if you have a process that modifying access rights is easy and it's, it functions well, don't be lazy. Create the proper user groups, don't grant direct rights to users, have a proper architecture in place so it stays maintainable. But actually many of these issues, at least on, on Asia side, they stem from the fact that Azure Active Directory and the traditional Active Directory, they are quite different by nature. Traditionally, Active Directory has been purely an IT tool. They use it to manage um, the identity of the employees, of the, of the systems, machines, granting people access to their workstation, using printers and stuff. Um, it has been always locked down really tightly because it's kind of this uh, single point of failure and keys to the kingdom kind of, kind of thing. Uh, many hackers always try to uh, attack the Active Directory because it grants you access everywhere. Um, and that's a good idea to protect it. 
However, in Asia world, Azure Active Directory does so much more than a traditional AD. And if your IT doesn't understand it very well and understand really well the Asia side of Azure Active Directory, um, you're going to run into issues because they want to protect, it, protect the system like their crew and shovel. However, you cannot, do, you cannot do things sensibly on the Azure side if it's too locked down. So as a takeaway, uh, if the IT has locked down the Azure Active Directory really tightly, you don't have owner rights. Uh, strict least privilege is going to be hard. Good. Then let's jump to networking. Um, I think networking is really boring. Uh, I wouldn't like to talk about it here, but we have to. Because it's, in my experience, it's the biggest reason for unexpected issues in your project. It's supposed to be super easy, straightforward, you just do it, and it ends up taking two months to get it right. Um, why is that? Well, first of all, um, in my projects where I work, at least, uh, most of the companies operate in some kind of a hybrid environment. They still have some on-prem systems we need to access. Um, they have a policy that all connections have to go through on-prem VPN. Um, you end up really easily having to do hybrid networking. It's complicated. Um, second of all, many platforms as a service components, at least on Asia side, have quite limited networking features. So if you're expecting that the past service, for example, a SQL database, uh, that it works identically to what you would have with virtual machines, you're going to have a bad time. And finally, because networking is in many bigger corporations handled by a silo. It might be an internal networking team, it might be an outsourced one to a MSP or something, or it might be a hybrid team. So some tasks are done internally, some are outsourced to the MSP. And I think here is actually the biggest key why networking issues are always so annoying in cloud projects. It's people. And you always end up designing and implementing stuff with, with a heap of stakeholders. And you always end up having these huge meetings where nobody really knows what needs to be done and you need to invite more people because the people you have are not sure or whatever. So, I have made this nice chart for you, which has the four kind of main isolation levels you can have on the networking side in Asia, uh, mapped on a scale where you have the additional protection on the x-axis, and then the amount of meetings with 15 people on the y-axis. And um, we are going to go through this. Um, on the left, bottom left is the easiest one, kind of the default setting usually which is everything open to the internet or anything open, everything open towards Asia. I think it's kind of the same. Um, that's not much protection, I would say. Um, that's self-explanatory, not going to go through that. So we jump directly to the trusted services. Um, if you haven't done Asia, trusted services is kind of this Asia-specific thingy where Asia says, uh, trust me, bro, and then it um, allow some traffic to pass through the firewalls with some black magic things. As an engineer, I don't like black magic. I want to know how it works. Still don't know how it works, so I'm always a bit wary about trusted services. Um, it's not available everywhere. Some combinations work. For example, you can configure that an Azure data factory can access a key vault uh, even though the firewall should block it. Um, However, my experience is, even though if I would like it, is that it's quite limited. And if the limitation is not on the service level, uh, it's on the feature level. For example, with storage accounts, only blob and data lake storage are supported. So if you then need to access file storage, well, sucks to be you. Then you need to redo your whole networking and you could have done it somehow else from the get-go. So works, sometimes, usually you will hit a wall. Um, then we have allow listing public IPs. So 
this means that um, we are still using public networking. We use public IPs. Um, however, we have static, pub, st static, static public IPs for all of your services, which means you can then allow list and block list those in the fire firewalls for your resources. Um, technically, this is actually pretty nice because if you're working in the same Asia region, uh, the traffic will never leave actually Asia backbone. So the performance is good and also security wise, the stuff doesn't go over the internet usually. So it's pretty nice. However, of course, there are downsides. So how do you actually get that static outbound IP address for your resource? Well, it really depends. Uh, for some resources, it's easier than for others. That's why I've also drawn these three different uh, balloons. So if your resources and the SQUs you're using support this out of the box, it's not that hard. You probably have to do some, some minor network, not stuff, maybe VNets, but it's not that bad. Some other services, it might be hard or impossible. Good example is if you're using Azure SQL Server and you do an operation where the database is calling some third party service where there is an IP restrictions. Good luck. It, you cannot get down by an IP address static to something you control. And of course, as we are still using public networking, uh, there is a risk for misconfigurations. So as there is a public IP, an interface, if you remove the restrictions, it's open. So depends. I personally like this quite much if it suits the use case. Because the last option, private networking, is, well, you might have noticed I dislike this a bit. It's not because I think it's bad or I would never do it. It's because it's so much work. Uh, and especially if you have a smaller project, this might end up being the kind of the biggest part of the project. So kind of traditional how you would do it also in on-prem. Uh, only private IPs on your resources. Uh, incoming traffic goes through a centralized firewall. You need some private DNS. You need some VPNs to get access for the developers, usually some bastion servers. Um, also some Azure services require an insane amount of private IPs, container apps over 500 IPs per environment. Even you would be running one container, 500 private IPs. Well, good if you have those, but some organizations are kind of running out of private IP spaces because they have so much stuff. You need a lot of pre-planning and uh, coordination between organizations. And to kind of make this even more concrete, I have an actually and recent example, what I did uh, for one of our clients. So they wanted to, do, to try out Azure ML for their experiments. Uh, Azure ML, quite highly loved service in Azure if you're doing M ML, makes things quite easy. However, the data is often quite sensitive. So you want to have a fully private deployment. So everything is kind of locked down also on the networking level. Um, before we go to the actual architecture, um, kind of so you understand what are the organizations working here. So um, Solidus role in this case was uh, mostly the actual mach machine learning part. So we had some data scientists with some data engineering skills. And then there was Oscar uh, doing the cloud definitions and helping out on the definitions on what do we actually need. Uh, the customer was owning the environment. So this means they were responsible for the access management and actually provisioning the things. And finally, there was a big MSP who was in charge of the whole networking at the customer. And yeah, again, this was a pretty big hybrid environment. So they had still a lot of things on-prem. So the same partner was responsible for the on-prem stuff as for the cloud networking stuff. Yeah, it looks like this. So if you don't happen to know much about Azure, basically we have this service, uh, machine learning workspaces, where we block the access from the public internet through the what I just explained. And then we have a virtual network 
where we have a lot of private endpoints uh, inside of them, inside of the virtual network. This means we can have a lot of services that are hosted in the cloud, are managed by Azure, but we get a private IP address to access them um, in a controlled manner. Um, and because it's private, we need a way for our developers and also maybe end users in this case, an end user might be a data scientist, to access the environment. And that would be then done through a VPN. Uh, well, how much did it took to implement it? Well, on the infrastructure side, it took around a week. Uh, it took me two days to get the templates working. There were some errors in the example templates and stuff, but I think around the time what I expected. Um, then the identity and access management was a bit more complicated than what I anticipated, um, because if you deploy this in a private network, uh, Azure demands that you use also Azure role-based access control. So you cannot access storage account with, with these keys, so storage account keys. You need to use the centralized Azure AD identity. So setting up those took a day maybe with an architect from the customer side. Nothing too bad. Um, getting a VPN connectivity, around six weeks of calendar time, two days for me just to sit in meetings and talk about things. And the final solution wasn't even what we really wanted to have. So we wanted to have a VPN connection so everybody can work on their own machine. Yeah, we got a remote desktop. And I don't know if, if many of you have to work with a remote desktop. It begins being like decent, but then when you notice that even copy pasting is not always working, it gets a bit annoying quite fast. Um, well, why is this so hard? Um, this gets quite technical, but anyhow, how Azure uh, works with private resources is that you need to do some DNS magic to make things work. So you need to host your own DNS zone that binds this uh, uh, private link uh, DNS name to a private IP uh, where your, in this case, database is accessible. This is really easy, as long as you're inside of your own VNet. It's laughably easy, five minutes. The issue is when you need to propagate that data out of your VNet. In this case, for the developers to access that, that workspace or the data engineers to access that workspace or the blob storages. And <clears throat> that's when you end up with DNS forwarding and routing. Uh, well, <laughs> routing is not that bad. We have done it always and it's part of like engineering. Uh, it's sometimes a bit annoying, but like that's not the issue. But DNS forwarding has been, in my experience, is a constant pain when doing things in Azure. And that's why these things are really terrifying, because there, is, there are never proper test environments for testing these things. So the network engineers are always working uh, in production. And doing changes in productions without testing them, well, I don't know. I dislike them. So these things always end up in huge meetings where they invite all of their engineers to make sure that they have thought of all of the things this could break. Because not a single network en engineer knows the network landscape 100%. Um, if you don't believe me that this is terrifying, well, this is the documentation picture from Microsoft. So how should you do this? Um, this is not even all of it. This is the first part of it. So it has quite many things and when you have three or four organizations involved, it's going to take at least calendar time. Uh, is this doable? Yeah, of course it is. Uh, if, if, the, if the networking team has done this before, it might be even just a ticket. Uh, but kind of, it, it really depends. You should maybe figure out if they have done this before. And if not, plan maybe two months of, of time to go back and forth. Good. Um, I'm already over time, so we are only going to go through a single architectural concept. So um, the idea is what architectural concepts usually cause grievance. And again, I think all of you have probably heard something like this. Container platforms. 
yeah, this is an over-engineering part of, of, of the speech. Um, Kubernetes is complex and it requires dedicated skills. So you cannot expect that your developers will just pick up Kubernetes in a week or two because you decided to draw it to the contract. So you cannot change it anymore. Uh, that you use a managed Kubernetes like AKS or EKS or GKE or whatever doesn't mean you don't have to have these skills. It just means that the engineer uh, who knows Kubernetes has to work a little bit less on the project. If you're working on Azure like me, please test out if app services or container instances would work for your use case. Uh, if not, if you, if you know that you need something a bit more modern, designed from the ground up for containers with some orchestrations and stuff, um, check out Azure container apps. It's quite new. I still also have some reservations if it's mature yet for real production use cases. But at least it's not going to be as resource intensive as running your own cluster. Good. Um, like I said, already on overtime, so let's jump to the takeaways. If you can work network-wise on an isolated island that you don't have to integrate to the corporate network, on-prem stuff, do that. Great. Going to be much more fun than doing the hybrid way. Also, the security guys are not pestering you the whole time when you don't have direct access to the mainframe databases or something like that. Um, don't underestimate the communication required when setting up fully private networking setup. Um, there are going to be a lot of people involved and there are a lot of things that you just cannot do. It's not about can you do this or do you know what needs to be done. It's more about can you communicate this to the people and do the people that need to do this have time and resources. Use centralized IAM, but don't go too overboard in making everything tight as possible. Be realistic how ready your organization is. And finally, don't invest in container platforms if you don't need one. Please. Or if you do, please don't call me when things get hard. I have done this quite many times lately. Good. Um, I used to have a Twitter account. Don't anymore. Uh, if you don't already work at Solita, you can actually get paid for debating me on my opinions. So check that out. If you already work for Solita, nice. See you in Slack tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you, uh, Oscar, for this presentation. I want to check some questions here. I think uh, we have time for one. Yes, uh, and actually we have one. So it says here, uh, in many cases, it seems that it's more about people and process than about technology. What's the reason why they are often lacking? That's a really complicated issue and, and thing, but I think uh, I think the main reasons are that uh, um, organizations have processes that come from a kind of an on-prem world and they were never changed to fit what's required in, in the cloud. In the cloud you need much more iterative processes, wherein as in on-prem you could do it more in a waterfall kind of way, meaning you could specify what resources your project needs beforehand, then you order the servers, the networks, and this kind of way. In the cloud, you quite often have more uncertainty. Great. Thank you, Oscar, for your presentation.